You are listening to ESG News and Views from the Conference Board. Welcome to this episode of ESG News and Views, the Conference Board's podcast series, which explores the latest trends and hottest topics in the world of corporate governance, sustainability, citizenship, and philanthropy. I'm Chuck Mitchell, Executive Director of Content Quality here at the Conference Board. And today's conversation will focus on that $64,000 question. When it comes to ESG priorities and issues around sustainability, what is keeping CEOs up at night? And what are their most important challenges now and in the future? And how are CEOs going to meet their goals in what amounts to a truly unique business and social environment? Joining me today is Paul Washington, Executive Director of the ESG Center at the Conference Board. Paul is a recognized thought leader and a distinguished career in the ESG space, having served as Senior Vice President and Deputy General Counsel and Corporate Secretary at Time Warner, among other positions in both the public and private sectors, before joining us here at the Conference Board. Welcome, Paul. Delighted to be here, Chuck. Thanks for having me. Great. Now let's dive right in. So we know from our recently released C-Suite Outlook report, and that's a global survey of more than 1,600 C-Suite executives and CEOs, that the disruptions caused by the pandemic, along with inflation, labor shortages, and supply chain bottlenecks, are seen as the major business disruptors for the coming year. But dig a little deeper into the governance side of things, and we found CEOs are taking into account a much broader group of stakeholders beyond shareholders in their strategy deliberations. So Paul, tell us, what does this tell us about the future of how CEOs are gonna look at their organizations, the importance of sustainability in the overall business environment, and why are CEOs now casting a wider net beyond shareholders? Uh, Thanks, Chuck, great question. So I think there are two fundamental trends at play here, both across the globe and especially in the United States. The first is a shift from capitalism that's focused primarily on serving a company's stockholders to one that's focused on serving multiple stakeholders. Now, companies have always needed to take their customers, employees, and communities into consideration, but now they're doing so in a somewhat different way, where they're looking them at them not just as important constituencies because they help to produce profits, but important constituencies in their own right, whose own welfare companies are seeking to serve. What goes along with that shift from stockholder to stakeholder focus is a shift in the evolution, in the, in the issues that companies are grappling with, no longer just ones about financial performance and so forth, but about environmental and social issues. And so you've got companies that are looking at broader issues and broader constituencies that they're trying to address. Um, There are many factors driving these, including during the pandemic, the rise in the importance of employees. This is really notable. You know, when COVID hit, the top priority for U.S. corporate boards, we know from our research, right after liquidity, right after the survival of the company, were its employees. And that has continued throughout this pandemic, throughout the social crises, and now through this era of great reassessment. So that's one thing driving it, is the concerns of employees. But really what's driving both of these trends to a large extent are investors themselves. Now you would think that's a little ironic, but investors, major institutional investors are thinking like stakeholders and they want companies to think of stakeholders and they want companies to think about these broader environmental and social issues. So Paul, is this a a seminal point in business history or is that an over-exaggeration? I think it's certainly a significant moment in business history. Um, You know, I've been in corporate governance now for about 30 years and there have been a few great trends here or waves. You know, there was a wave after Enron when there was a big focus on board accountability. Then after the financial crisis, there was a big wave of reforms addressing shareholder power and giving shareholders more power over the company. Now, this is different um, because this is giving stakeholders more of a say in the company. And it's not being brought about by regulation. It's being brought about by market forces. And so I actually think that in some ways, this may prove to be more durable, but In other ways, it's going to be more diverse because unlike 
the post-Enron reforms and the post-financial collapse reforms, which were rules that applied to all companies. What's different now is every company gets to decide where it wants to be on the stockholder to stakeholder spectrum and where it wants to be in addressing environmental and social issues. Companies have a lot more flexibility to determine where they want to play in this new era. Yeah, good point. I, you know, it's interesting that it, uh, when looking at uh, the list of uh, stakeholder uh, stakeholder rankings uh, by CEOs, that last on that list is uh, is the media, and that was just ahead of uh, NGOs and activists. So, I guess it, this raises the point: Is there a danger that making these groups media uh, and, and and activists such a low priority that that they'll end up setting this context around sustainability and governance, and maybe force companies to be on the defensive? So I know your center is, has stressed the importance of getting out in front of the story rather than letting others seek the agenda or set the agenda. So uh, is that a danger? It definitely is. And let me just take corporate political activity as an example. So we know that 2021 was a very tough year for US corporations when it came to political activity. They were under increased scrutiny from the media, from employees, um, from within their own company by senior management and by the board, right? Um, and at the same time, they were having to deal with external factors, unexpected legislation at the state level, um, the events of January 6th in Washington, that made 2021 a difficult year. Um, 2022 promises to be the same or even more so. It's a midterm election year. Now, companies are putting a lot of effort into bringing their employees along and helping them understand what the company is doing in terms of its lobbying and what it's doing in terms of its political contributions. We know that from our survey. But companies are not devoting much attention to educating the media about what they're doing. Now, they may not feel like it's, there's much to be gained with it, but one of the things that companies need to you know, remember is a lot of what they responded to in this past year were media firestorms, traditional media firestorms, social media firestorms, which are often driven by NGOs and others. So companies really need to be paying attention to mainstream and social media and getting word out. Because I think, you know, each company can decide whether it wants to be involved in corporate political activity, contributions and lobbying, but it shouldn't do so apologetically. It should do so, companies should do so, you know, not on their back foot, but they should do so saying, look, this is why we do it. This is why it's in the company's best interest and why it's in society's best interest for us to weigh in on these things. And this is how we weigh in. And that message has to get uh, out to the broader media or companies are going to face an uphill battle over and over again. Yeah, and we certainly know from our research too that uh, employees are demanding uh, more public outreach, more public uh, public statements around controversial issues. So it certainly uh, creates a bit of a minefield at times, but to, in, in order to have it prioritized by stakeholder, and uh, that's really an important aspect of it. So I, I think that that's a, that's a good point and a, and a real kind of red flag in a sense of, of prioritization too. So, but you said in the past that CEOs need to build a greater consensus within the C-suite on how to approach sustainability overall. It's a big lift. How do you do that? It is a big lift. And we've seen that, um, you know, CEOs place sustainability globally as their number seven priority out of 10. CFOs place it 10th, last. And human capital leaders place it third. So there's clearly this uh, range of views of where sustainability, for example, ranks in terms of urgency across yeah, the I, You know, and it's interesting that say, CEOs in our survey ranked uh, economic opportunity, economic equality, labor conditions, and, and gender equality as their top three social priorities in the ESG sphere. But, uh, but there's considerable difference on a geographic basis. Was there anything that, that stands out on a regional basis to you? Yeah, I, I think that there are both the areas that you mentioned that are common, which are important. And let me just talk about the one common area, which is economic equality and opportunity. Companies don't do a great job when they're telling their E, environmental, S, social, and G, governance story about focusing on the economy. Companies generate jobs. Companies pay taxes. 
at least you hope they do, right? And so companies can do a much better job of getting their economic story out to the press and to other constituencies. But one of the biggest divergences is about race. In the United States, uh, CEOs rank um, racism as their number one priority after economic opportunity and equality. And so that's that really stands out. I think one of the issues is, you know, it's not that race is unimportant outside the U.S., but it's a very complicated issue and involves nationalism and religious discrimination and multiple different factors. So it's a much trickier issue. And frankly, in a lot of places around the world, um, people don't want to talk about it. Yeah, we certainly know that in Asia, we've done some work in uh, in Asia and that the talk around uh, around race and ethnicity uh, it is a, there's a reluctance uh, for both management side and employee side to address those issues head on. And it's creating a lot of tension uh, in, in the workplace in, uh, in the Asia Pacific. So that, that that's really an important point. Yeah, and I'll put a plug in that we will be coming out with a report based on a roundtable and interviews with some of the world's leading thinkers on this topic, addressing how companies through their corporate citizenship efforts can try to tackle these very thorny issues that are sometimes a little bit under the, the radar screen. Yeah, we'll certainly look out for that. It should be pretty interesting. So, so far, we've looked at how the pandemic is uh, shaping CEO ESG priorities now and for years to come. Uh, but what other challenges do organizations face to meet the commitments to a multi-stakeholder community? We're going to take a short break and be right back with more of our conversation with Paul Washington. Are you a leader of your organization looking for straightforward, data-driven business guidance? Then look no further than the Conference Board's new podcast series, CEO Perspectives. The Conference Board is a business think tank that provides trusted insights for what's ahead to the world's leading companies. Each episode features a 30-minute conversation by some of the Conference Board's noted subject matter experts, discussing a range of relevant business issues critical to CEOs right now, such as the return to workplace, infrastructure spending, and where U.S.-China relations are headed, among other timely topics. You can find our new podcast series on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. We invite you to listen and subscribe to CEO Perspectives, brought to you by the Conference Board. Welcome back to ESG News and Views. I'm your host, Chuck Mitchell, Executive Director of Content Quality here at the Conference Board. And I'm joined by Paul Washington, who heads the ESG Center of the Conference Board. Paul, what are the common challenges and, and opportunities companies are facing in making sustainability part of their business? Great question. I think that what we're hearing from our member companies, and we've got about 180 companies that belong to the ESG Center, and they, they're really six main ones um, that go to your, to your question. One is first identifying the issues that truly matter. Not that are somehow they matter because it's a popularity contest and you know more people vote for this issue over another, but the issues that matter in terms of impact, where can your company truly have impact on its own bottom line and on society and the environment? So figuring out what matters. Second, identifying all those areas where sustainability um, connects with your business. How do you integrate sustainability into your business? How do you integrate into your strategy, your M&A? your operations and so forth. The third great issue is how do you set goals in this area? Do you just set these bold, ambitious goals about the climate, about climate that are 20 years out? Or do you set more near-term incremental and perhaps achievable goals? Uh, the next challenge is how do you organize yourself at the board and management level to achieve your goals? The fifth challenge is how do you tell your sustainability story effectively to multiple constituencies? And the final one is how do you deal with the, what we call the ESG industry, the three R's of regulators, reporting frameworks, and rating agencies. Those are common challenges, but what sits at the heart of all of those is building a culture at your company that embraces sustainability. So everyone from the board and CEO down to the people on the front lines, you know, are thinking about um, the connection between their daily work and the sustainability of the company, its impact on stakeholders, its impact on society, and its impact on the environment at large. 
That is a long-term challenge for companies. It's also a great opportunity because if you get everyone thinking and acting with sustainability in mind, you can really unleash the creative energies of your firm. Yeah, but it's, it's a challenge indeed. And with all these changes underway, um, should this be reflected in the boardroom? You know, it, it, another really good question. I, I think that companies kind of go down in the wrong direction. And I may be talking myself out of a corporate board seat here, but I think companies kind of go in the wrong direction if they're just looking for a bunch of uh, siloed experts to serve on your board. Okay, we've got our cyber expert, we've got our ESG expert, we've got our XYZ expert. You know, what you really want to do is to have um, broad fluency on uh, sustainability and ESG topics, if you will, on your board. Um, expertise is fine as well, but re really matters is a focus on board education and um, you know board engagement on these subjects, so that people can think about them and 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 talk in an intelligent way with each other and with shareholders and with others about the topic. I think that's more important than than having a bunch of experts. You may want to revisit your committee structures and so forth, but I, I think really the the challenge here is one much more of education and fluency than it is in radical governance changes. Yeah, really good points. And, you know, I, I guess what's what's the main piece of advice you would offer to boards and CEOs to, to navigate this era of sustainability, the era of stakeholder capitalism? I think it's actually taking the long-term view, which is hard to do when you're when everyone's pushing on you to do more and to do more quickly. Um, you know, the challenges that we're dealing with here, whether you're trying to trace racial inequality or climate change, water pollution and so forth, um, you really need to take an approach that is, that is durable. You can't just uh, run after this month's or this year's flavor of whatever the terminology or or push might be. That's true with this year's proxy season. We expect there will be more shareholder proposals on environmental and social issues. There will be more that will come to a vote because companies cannot negotiate them away. And when they come to a vote, they will get higher voting results. Boards shouldn't, you know, put it colloquially, freak out about this, right? Um, what really matters is not how many shareholder proposals come to a vote or even the percentage they get. Don't judge your management team by that. There is a way of going on. What you can judge your management team and yourselves on is how well have we engaged in a constructive manner with our long-term shareholders about these issues? Have we maintained a good working relationship with them? Because that's what's going to matter in the long run. Well, great, great food for thought. And Thanks for joining us today. Um, and thanks for all of you for listening to ESG News and Views uh, brought to you by the Conference Board. And for more uh, on our 22 C-Suite Outlook, uh, including the full report, other podcasts and webcasts, uh, please visit our website. That's at www.conference-board.org. And again, thanks for listening and see you all soon. This has been ESG News and Views from the Conference Board.